if it's something you love, then you should do it. And I, I say that about anything, but especially the arts, because it's needed. It is absolutely needed. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting today with Eric Snoza, who is the bass player and co-founder of Fifth House Ensemble. Now, I've been familiar with this group for years. Eric lives in Chicago, in the Chicago area. I lived in Chicago for a long time. I actually bought my bass, my Jackstad, from Eric. If you look at the cover art for the podcast, that's Eric's old bass. And Fifth House Ensemble, to me, is a perfect example of scratching your own itch. Eric had moved to Chicago, was trying to figure out what to do, and he and Melissa Snoza started Fifth House Ensemble. It has grown into this vibrant, multifaceted group doing all sorts of things in the world of education and performing, and we, we get into that and so much more in this conversation. You're going to totally love it. And before we get going here, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. They are Upton Bass, D'Addario Strings, Robertson and Sons Violins, and A440. You're also going to be hearing a couple excerpts from Eric. This is, and Fifth House Ensemble, this is Caleb Burhan's Excelsior. We'll start with that and we'll round out the show with a short excerpt of John Zorn's The Temptations of St. Anthony. Eric and I got together while I was in Chicago for some other work. We we're hanging out at Evanston's Farmhouse, which is a wonderful place, by the way. So if you're hearing some rock and bumping music and lively conversation, that's how it works. I love doing these live conversations. It's so much fun to hang out in person. And Eric and I had a great time. Know you're going to love this conversation. Fifth-house.com is their website. And we'll have a link to that and everything in the show notes. All right, here we go with our conversation featuring Eric Snoza. I'm here with Eric Snoza in Evanston, Illinois. Eric is the guy who I bought my bass from 11 or 12 years ago, like this beautiful jack stat that people rave about. And so just welcome Thank to you. the podcast, long overdue. I appreciate it. And, and so Eric is one of the people behind the Fifth House Ensemble, and they have, I mean, talk about crushing it. They, they've uh, multiple MacArthur grants for various projects, and they're just like uh, traveling all over the place, educational projects, performance projects. But I thought it'd be good to like rewind, and Eric and I are actually both from with about three hours of each other. You're, mm -hmm. you're from Omaha, Nebraska? Omaha, right? yeah. Okay. Tell us how you got into music and what that was like for you in Omaha. Sure. Well, it, it actually started all the way back in third grade, and my uh, uh, who became my professor, Bill Ritchie, was uh, outperforming at uh, the, the school that I was at, and I, I saw the instrument, I saw their performance, and I was immediately just captivated. And uh, I went home immediately and said to my mom, I, I need to play an instrument. And uh, we picked up uh, a violin and showed up the next week for music. And uh, everybody had showed up with a violin, unfortunately. And so they, uh, they said, all right, well, we need somebody on viola. And I didn't want to do that at the time. Uh, a girl beat me to the cello. And he said, who wants to play bass? And I remembered my, my future teacher being there. And I was like, I want to play the bass. And uh, so I said, I'll do it, not knowing really what it was, and showed up the next week, and they had this three-quarter size bass for me. And again, I was in third grade, so this was far too big for me, uh, so much so that the janitor had to make a footstool just so that I could get up and reach the notes and, and play the bass. Um, but I, I loved it ever since then because I just felt that I was, I was picking it up more quickly, and I loved the sound of it. I uh, loved playing it, and a, you know, a few years later, I started studying with Bill, and uh, just f completely fell in love with the bass and making music. And then headed to Eastman. Yeah. James Vandermark, past yes. podcast guest, great yeah. guy, super influential, 40 plus years at Eastman. Absolutely. What was that experience like going to Eastman from Omaha? Yeah, well, it was a uh, culture shock to say the least. Because, um, yeah, I, I, you, you know, you're going from a relatively small town uh, to just a, an entire school full of some of the greatest artists in the country and around the world. Um, but it was inspiring. And I, I spent hours and hours in the practice room because I wanted to live up to the potential of my surroundings. And I wanted to make, you know, I, I, every day I aspired to make JB proud. 
uh, of what I was doing. Um, and it, fortunately, I met fellow colleagues there like Brett Shirtliff, Matt Baker. Then we, we became the best of friends because we were constantly pushing each other. It's like, oh, you're playing Saguna Weizen? Well, I can do that. I, I want to do that. That sounds fantastic. Oh, you're doing the Tubin Concerto? I, I have to do that. Let's, let's do that. So it was this you know, friendly competition that kept pushing us forward and forward. Uh, and, and I feel every day fortunate that, we, that I met JB because um, all you had to do was just watch him. And, and, and how he was living and what he was doing. And a, a lot of that fed into the concepts that fit behind Fifth House Ensemble uh, because he was always looking to the future. It was always, what, what, what's five years down the road? What's 10 years down the road? And uh, I know we, we discussed this, this one meeting that we had uh, when we were sitting just as a group of bass players in, in the room. And you know, somebody piped up and said, uh, you know, so how is it that we, we go out and make a CD? And he stopped in his tracks and said, don't worry about it, because 10 years from now, we're not going to have CDs. And sure enough, eight, 10 years later, there's no more CDs. And I, that just always floored me that he was always looking to the future. And even more than that, he was always following the things that he loved. Whatever he was passionate about, he pursued a thousand percent and then always found a way to pull that back into his artistry and relate that to music. It's a beautiful, beautiful trait to have, and what a cool, what a cool early mentor in, in your life. And you're you're at Eastman, and was Chicago the next step for you post Eastman? I wish I could say it was a planned step, uh, right? Right. But it was definitely, uh, you know, if you're looking at fate, I, I suppose it was. Um, so uh, Melissa, uh, who I was engaged to at the time, uh, had won a job with the Chicago Civic Orchestra. And of course, that meant that I was moving to Chicago, which was ended up being the, the best thing that could possibly happen. And so she moved to Chicago and was uh, working within the Chicago Civic Orchestra. And as part of what they do there, they, they create chamber music groups that go out into community and do education work. Um, and that wind quintet that she was initially a part of was the genesis of Fifth House Ensemble. And the, those members started that organization um, and then I immediately, you know, fed into that. Uh, and from there, that, that, that spawned our artist work and our initial education work that we started doing here in Chicago. And we immediately felt the love from this town because we found that over the years, Chicago is this unique place where you can do things that are not the norm, that are not the standard. You can kind of throw stuff against a wall to see what sticks. And there's an audience there for it because they're always looking for, you know, what's new, what's exciting, what's different. Okay, it'd be great. Can you just, like, at this point, we're recording at the very end of 2017, like, what does the, the professional landscape for Fifth House Ensemble look like? The different silos that you work in? And then maybe we can, like, rewind and talk about how you got to that point because I think that'd be super interesting for people. Sure. So we have about... Uh, four main silos of what we do in Fifth House. Um, th the first is our artistic programming, which uh, you know we conceive as always trying to find new and unique ways in which chamber music can tell a story. And we do that through the unique collaborators that we work with. And we work with collaborators that are both in and outside of the music industry. So this could mean that you know back in 2000. Eight and nine, we were working with a graphic novelist to create an original three-part graphic novel series based on this body of chamber music that we wanted to play. Uh, this could also mean that we're working with, you know, artists that are in and outside of our genre. So we've collaborated with uh, Balladino, which is a Mediterranean folk band from Tel Aviv. Uh, we've created, uh, collaborated with uh, the Henhouse Prowlers, which is this fantastic bluegrass band here in the states. Um, and we've also collaborated with uh, Austin Wintery who is a uh, Grammy-nominated composer for the video game music Journey. And we created the very first live interactive concert uh, where we invited game players on stage with us to play the game as we were performing the score. Uh, so we're always looking for new and unique ways to tell the story. And that's, that's more or less the, the artistic side of what we do. Uh, but the other really big component of what we do is our education wing. Uh, in which we reach about 18 to 20,000 students every year through the Chicago public school system. And that's through a combination of our assembly performances as well as our curriculum integration where we're actually uh, creating anywhere from four to 16 week residencies alongside teachers where we're um, 
commingling, co- commingling their current curriculum with a music curriculum. Um, and we always end up with some sort of final product that's taking the culmination of those students' efforts, and they get to present it to the rest of the students of that school. So through the, the combination of these efforts uh, between the artistic and the education, we're kind of the seeds, the, the, the very basis of Fifth House. And doing more and more work, it kind of spawned into other things, uh, especially through the, the education. It started to develop into this new silo of our civic practice and outreach, um, where we are you know, currently working with places like Deborah's Place, which is a women's shelter, uh, teaching a blues poetry and music curriculum. Uh, we're also in residence at uh, the Nancy B. Jefferson School, which is in the juvenile detention facility. Uh, we've worked with St. Leonard's Ministries, which is a halfway house. And all of these places is in an effort to use music as a catalyst for conversation, uh, a, a means of starting those open lines of communication to gather stories and then to find ways of telling those stories in the end, again, using music as kind of the propelling factor. Um, and we were, we were so enthralled with, like, those civic efforts that we wanted to keep expanding and we were very fortunate that a few years ago uh, we, we started working with DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana and uh, you know they had this question of like how is it that we can bring the surrounding communities, those small businesses and agricultural communities into our amazing concert space and so we used our efforts that we'd already done through our other civic practice outreach efforts in Chicago and brought that to Greencastle and we were doing concerts around the community and while we were doing that we were gathering stories and collecting information and we started to notice that as we were getting these answers a lot of them started repeating and so we were able to form this narrative of Greencastle Indiana that ended up telling their complete story the good and the bad and everything in between and this afforded us the opportunity to work with um, teachers students local folk singers jazz artists um, along with talking with teachers we went went out to the small businesses we went out to the farmers and asked their stories and we did video and audio interviews and all of these assets all of these elements that we collected along the 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 one year that we were there fed into this final concert on mother's day which was called harvest and the impact of that was it was so substantial we were able to bring in over 600 people on mother's day and uh roughly 40 percent of them had never been to that concert space before and roughly 60% uh, heard about it by word of mouth. And it was so compelling because they were getting to see their stories projected on the big screen as, as told through artists that were not only Fifth House, but local musicians, uh, folk singers, jazz artists, poets, dancers, um, all telling their story. And I think the moment that we knew we were on the right path and this is something that we wanted to continue doing, was after the concert, I had went up and I had spoken with one of the farmers that we had an in-depth interview with. And I congratulated him and I thanked him for everything that he submitted. And this other woman walked up to us and she reached out her hand to, to, I thought to shake my hand, but she was actually wanting to shake the farmer's hand, Jerry. And she said, uh, hi Jerry, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I've been your neighbor for 20 years and we've never actually met before. And the second that I heard that, I took five steps back and let that conversation just happen because I, I, I knew that this product, what we were able to do was to bring a community together. Even if they were neighbors, they just had never met. And it was so compelling to me that I was like, this is, this is what we need to continue to do. So the, the outreach and civic practice uh, is the, the, the third and definitely one of the bigger arms and something that we're trying to grow and take to different communities around the country. Um, and last but not least, the entrepreneurship side of what we do. Uh, you know, ever since we left college, we've been designing all these things from designing the business structure that we're under to the education programs and the outreach. Um, and all of these things, unfortunately, we had to learn ourselves. Uh, you know, we, we were fortunate that Melissa and I were uh, Eastman School of Music during the genesis of their um, uh, arts entrepreneurship program. And we got a lot of things that started us off. But a lot of it that we learned post, we had to learn on our own, and we fell on our faces a lot. But only by falling on our faces and picking ourselves up and learning from it, we picked up these skills. And we realized that 
we could teach these skills. And it would, be be it would be better for us to go out to these universities and to teach them while it's still fresh and before they have to get out in the real world and struggle. It's like, why should they have to struggle if they don't need to? So we developed entire curriculums, uh, everything from uh, how to start your own business, how to do programming, public speaking, uh, contracting, how to do civic engagement. Um, and we were teaching it to students, and now we're even teaching it to educators and how to teach their students these concepts. So between um, artistic programming, education, entrepreneurship, and civic practice, that's pretty much the foundations of Fifth House. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violins. For more than 40 years, over four decades, Robertson and Sons has specialized in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. Their modern facility, which is totally beautiful, by the way, if you're ever able to make it out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I highly recommend it. They have a recital hall that they use not only for performances, but it's available to their clients. So if you want to try out a fine pedigree base or even a student base or anything in between, you can go in that recital hall. I've had the chance to do that. Totally amazing. I'm like a kid in the candy store when I'm down there at Robertson's. Check them out online at robertsonsviolins.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the good folks at Upton Bass String Instrument Company. Eric and Gary and the whole Upton team, I can't say enough good things about them. And they have been on board with the various endeavors I've done online from the start. They were one of the early sponsors of the blog back in 2006 and 2007. And it has been so fun to follow along with their journey and see them develop these new models of basses like the car bass, the Bostonian, the Bohemian, and to connect with all these amazing players. I've had the privilege of speaking with so many people that play Upton Basses from Eric Rivas of Branford Marcellus's band and Lucia Torino of The Devil Makes Three, all the way over to Anthony Monzo of the New Century Chamber Orchestra and Kevin Smith, Willie Nelson's bass player. I've had many students purchase Upton basses over the years. I've had a lot of colleagues play Upton basses. I see them on gigs all the time. They play great and Upton stands behind their work. Can't recommend them highly enough. Check them out online at uptonbass.com. Well, so so, I, so I'm a bass player, and I'm in school, and I'm studying. I'm practicing my Beethoven five, and I'm my Bottazzini second concerto, and I'm gonna take some auditions, but I don't know if that's my path for me. Like, and I'm probably missing a lot of skills. Everything that you just described, right? I, I I don't know how to I don't know how to write a grant. I don't know how to form a business. I don't know. I, I'm not very good at speaking in public. Like, what what should I? What are some things I can do to? position myself to have have a broader possibilities for careers sure the the first thing is that you have to follow what it is that you love yeah. and that what you're passionate about and to think outside of just your bass playing so for instance the uh, journey live program where we were collaborating with austin wintry came out of a passion for me of video games I, I loved playing video games, and when I played this particular video game, uh, I knew I wanted to do something with it. And it just so happens that I play bass, but I wanted to find a way to combine those things. How, how can I bring those all together to combine two things that I'm passionate about? So it all starts with a passion. Um, and JB was a prime example of this and how I was inspired to do these sort of things. Um, you know, if he was passionate about motorcycles, he went to the nth degree to study motorcycles, to race them, to figure out every aspect of it. Uh, when he got into boxing, he, he learned everything that there was about it and then found a way to bring that back to his students and integrate that into his curriculum, uh, which I just, I, I found fascinating and I wanted to, I wanted to do that myself. Um, but as far as taking it to the next level, there, there are resources out there. Um, and again, one of the reasons that we travel the country, but I have to say that that was the biggest reason that we started our summer music festival, which is called uh, Fresh Ink Festival, INC. Um, and our Fresh Ink Festival is a, is a two-week uh, festival in which we bring in 16 composers and you know around 25 instrumentalists from around the country. And uh, during those two weeks, it's a very intensive arts entrepreneurship training where, again, we're going over everything from public speaking, programming, education, civic practice, and digging in depth, not just speaking of things in ethereal concepts, but 
digging into the nuts and bolts, step one, step two, step three. This is how you do these things. This is how you decide whether you're going to be an LLC or a not-for-profit or a corporation. Um, and then how, to, when you bring that into the schools, what are the steps for communication? Uh, so we go step by step on how to do these simultaneously, uh, creating 16 brand new works of chamber music and Fifth House performing side by side with the musicians, uh, going out and doing uh, roughly about 12 performances around Kenosha, Milwaukee, and Chicago. So these, these students are getting firsthand experience in how to engage presenters, how to engage your community, how to create programming, and how to go out and do education work. So all of the things that we learned over the past 12 years, we're trying to impart as much of the nuts and bolts in those two weeks as possible. So that's one of our efforts. But again, we, t we continue to travel around the country and try and teach these things so that they, they have the first steps when they leave college. They know that if I follow these, I'll at least be on my way. And then I can take that bass playing and I can take those other passions that I have and find ways of combining it and providing it as a service to the rest of my community. Uh, you guys have had tremendous success with Kickstarter. Yes. And and that's that, that many, many listening may have experimented with it or certainly know about it. Uh, can you talk a bit about the Kickstarters the projects that you've done sure. and why you felt like that was a good model? Absolutely. So the... Kickstarter is because of our Journey Live program. And uh, when we had formulated the concept with Austin Wintry, we had a couple places lined up uh, for performances, including uh, the MSA here in Chicago, as well as the uh, MAGFest, which is a music and gaming festival in Baltimore. And uh, we, we had the tour lined up, and we were about $5,000 shy of the budget that we would like to have gotten. Um, now, we could have made that up, but we thought this was a prime opportunity to engage Kickstarter. And the reason that we love that is it's uh, for several reasons. One is the all or nothing model, which is, um, you know, you, you have to meet your goal in order to receive the funds from Kickstarter, which enabled us to have, have that uh, re-engagement with the fans and supporters of the project. Um, you know, if we do not meet this, we don't get this. So we need your help in order to achieve this. So, you know, and we, we would get initial, initial interest and then maybe things would wane off a little bit. But then we, we could put out another, another release or another reward or something else to incentivize and say we need to meet our goals in order to make this happen. And the fans were extremely supportive of this. Um, another big reason that we did this is because it allowed us to engage not only Fifth House fans, but Austin Wintory's fans and the fans of Journey, which are substantial. They... <laughs> They are literally around the world. And if you've never played the game, I highly recommend it. Um, but it, it is an experience. It's one of the very first experiential video games that, that I could ever recommend to you. Um, anyway, so we, we, uh, we decided on Kickstarter, and we had some really good incentives to start things off. Um, but what we started noticing is that the support uh, was exponential in, in that... Um, you know, we, we achieved our $5,000 goal within two hours. And so we had 29 and a half more days <laughs> to go. <laughs> big and problem to have. Big, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great problem to have. Um, and we, by, by the end of the 30 days, we'd achieved, um, you know, over $52,000 towards this. Uh, but what we found in the, the, the second and biggest reason why we wanted to use Kickstarter is because they, they, they maintain a database of those people that are supporting you. So we, not, we knew from where in the country and had contact with those people, uh, those people that were supporting us. So that allowed us, to, after we'd reached our initial goal, to say, hey, we want to come visit your city. If you want to support this project, let us know. And it, you know, if it's New York or if it's L.A. or if it's Seattle, tell us. And that's where we'll have our next concerts. So that kind of let us you know, set up a tour or an idea of where we wanted to bring this show next. And again, with that same database, we can keep those fans constantly in contact with us and let us know when we're performing, where we're performing. And the best thing that I have found is it allows us to engage the fans almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we, we have gained so many new collaborators just from the fans of this project. Um, Angela Bermudez, who lives in Costa Rica, is an amazing artist, cosplayer, designer. And uh, she had contacted us through... Twitter 
And uh, when we saw her work, we were like, well, we just, we need to work with you. And so that developed into an entire education program where we were doing live performance and live art at the same time. And we were able to bring this final product of a painting and music to these kids all around Chicago. Uh, we were able to engage fans that just l love, love the artistry behind it and they love creating fan art. So we had a fan art contest and we presented the top three winners uh, before every one of our shows. So it's, it's really a way to engage the fans to make them a part of the experience and, and not just bringing a show. Yeah. Grant writing yes. is something that you've been tremendously successful with. I mean, MacArthur Grants, wow, you know, and, and, and can you talk through some, how y your organization's approach to grant writing and maybe some pitfalls that people fall into, things that you've realized help the process? Sure. Uh, well, first off, I have to say that uh, we, we are very fortunate at Fifth House to have uh, Melissa Snoza, who's our executive director and uh, flutist, uh, kind of at the helm of that because yeah. uh, she's literally a genius. Um, and when we first started this out, all of these concepts behind grant writing and starting your own business, she had to learn on her own. Mm -hmm. And at this point, she's basically mastered it. Um, but as far as like some of the tips and tricks and, and the success behind it, uh, one is having a heartfelt product um, and not doing what we call mission creep. Uh, if, you, if you know what you want to do as an organization or as a group or even as an individual artist, you need to stick to that mission or that artist statement and make sure that whatever you're applying for feeds back into that idea. Because if you start delving out and just looking for money for the sake of money, uh, you start to lose a sense of who you are as an artist or as a group. Um, and the, the next biggest thing is that you need to have a personal connection uh, to all the grant writing organizations. I mean, the biggest thing that we have found and the biggest piece of advice is you need to know the people behind the people who are giving you that money. Uh, you know, there, there will be times where they may have put up certain guidelines, um, but maybe they had other ideas or deeper intentions behind what's just written online or on the page. And unless you take the time to call and find out and, and really dig into that, you might have missed something, uh, you know, something that's fairly obvious. And, and certainly when we're going for the bigger grants, um, FaceTime is key. You're building a personal relationship with an organization, but you need to also be building a relationship with the people behind that organization. So FaceTime is absolutely incredible. They need to know who you are personally, who you stand for as an artist and as an organization. So a lot of the work that you do, or much of the work that you do, involves uh, performances at universities around around the area, and you you book yourself as a performing organization, but it goes way beyond that. Sure. Also, can you talk about this? How that whole process works, and like what what you offer? I think it's a totally fascinating model. What you do, like what you what you end up offering to a lot of different schools that you end up. Uh, Visioning? Sure. So, it, uh, again, with the, the four different silos of what we have as an organization, uh, artistic programming, education, uh, outreach, and entrepreneurship, we could be approaching a university for any one of those just individually. Uh, but we, what we found to be successful on our end is uh, when we have a particular program of interest, so let's say our Journey Live project, uh, we can offer to a presenter that we're going to be able to bring them um, a completely different demographic of audience, a different type of audience. We're going to be able to offer them extremely unique programming and an extremely unique collaboration and something new that they've never seen. But we can also offer them and their students um, arts entrepreneurship training. We can offer the education side of their university training on education and outreach, um, entrepreneurship, all of these different things that we can offer, which is great. Um, because oftentimes they're trying to look for cross-departmental collaborations. How is it that I, on the performance side of this school, can work with the education side of the university? How can I work with entrepreneurship? Or how can I even work with other sides of the university like business, contracting, lawyers, doctors? Um, and a lot of the concepts that we teach that apply to artists also apply across the university. So to be able to offer an interesting artistic product but be able to supplement that 
or even lead with the entrepreneurship and civic practice side of what we do uh, has been extremely successful and um, it's a big part of what we do. So, so people listening, they, they hear all these things that you're involved with and thinking like, ah, what do I, it's unbelievable, it's, it's this big staff and it's doing all this, but like, and, 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 the, and the people managing these different projects that have grown, but in the early days, right. it, was, it was just you or you and Melissa, what, what was it like in the early days and then how, how has that grown just in terms of uh, like the, the the hands involved in all these various projects. Yeah, we don't sleep much. Yeah, well, I'm <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Um, I would say with any new organization that's starting out, um, you, the, the players are going to be as much integral in the administrative side of things uh, as they are playing. Uh, and that's exactly the way that it started out. Uh, the, the initial performers, we each carried on specific roles. So Melissa starting off as executive director, we had somebody that was running education. Uh, we had somebody that was in charge of booking, somebody else in the group that was doing more or less of the marketing. Um, and as you grow, you, have to st- you, you get to a breaking point. And this will happen several times throughout your growth where you just get to a point where it's like, I cannot handle any more. I need to delegate a portion of my position to somebody else. So in the very beginning, believe it or not, Melissa was running as executive director, head of education, and helping out with a lot of the marketing efforts. Uh, she's only one person, so that had to get delegated down. Uh, so th- as I mentioned, it split off into kind of some of the different silos of what we were doing. Uh, but even then, it, we just got so busy that we were afraid that the artistic side was going to suffer, so we needed to de- delegate out even further. And fortunately for us, we got to the point where we were able to h- hire part-time staff to help with marketing, and then eventually that grew into some full-time staff that are now completely in control of marketing uh, and operations. So we have our operations and marketing director, Danny Cohen, uh, who we could not live without. Uh, we have the head of our uh, artistic coordinator, Jessica Smith, uh, Jessica Wolf, excuse me, that is um, uh, basically doing all of our local efforts and communication with a lot of the presenters. Again, couldn't, couldn't live without her. Um, and then some of the musicians have maintained certain efforts. So, for instance, um, I'll, I'll help with a lot of you know, some of the design. I run my own photography studio as well, so I help with a lot of the photography. Um, but then each of, the, each of the players within the group will kind of spearhead certain efforts. So there are those of us that really focus on leading the education efforts. There are those of us that can handle the entrepreneurship, public speaking efforts. Um, and then there are those of us that just keep the artistic product fresh, up to date, and, and, and new and cutting edge. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Check out their Zyx Strings, which are synthetic core strings that produce an extremely warm, rich sound. Get the sound and feel of gut strings with more evenness, projection, and stability than real gut. Thanks for sponsoring the podcast, D'Addario. This episode is brought to you by the A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Well, talk to me about public speaking and what you teach in terms of public speaking. We were chatting, Eric and I have been hanging out for a bit before we flipped the mics, and we were chatting about this, and it's totally fascinating, the, just, just how you approach that. Can you just go into some details on that? Sure. It's, uh, unfortunately, one of those things that's just... Again, not taught unless you've been yeah. a part of a debate team um, or, or you know gone to communications. You don't realize the importance of what you say and how you say it and how that plays into your artistic product. So a lot of what we do is going in and teaching some of the basics, um, how to deliver a speech, how to start communication or even start a conversation. Uh, but more importantly, when you're delivering an artistic product, how to make a connection between your artistic product and the audience. And we teach how to do that going through you as the artist, which is basically, how is it that A, I can connect with you as an audience, which means A, you have to get to know your audience, 
And then B, what are some personal things that I can share that will connect? And then through that connection, once you've made that connection from audience to performer, then I can connect it to the piece or the program that I'm trying to present. And through that connection, you've built a relationship then, a direct relationship between the audience and the piece or the program that you're trying to present. So we'll do everything from uh, you know, body language, uh, the words that you're using, uh, facial expressions, and then uh, examples of how to draw those connections through connective statements. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many, so many ways in which, we're again, we're just not taught that we try to do by instinct, but when you get up in front of a crowd, all of a sudden all those things go right out the window. Uh, so we also teach that it's something that is, uh, you have to practice. Much like playing the bass, uh, in, in order to do really good public speaking, you have to get out there and do it, which means how is it that I can walk up to a stranger and carry on a conversation? And, it, you know, in a world of, that's led by social media and, you know, connecting through text, it's, it's such a strange thing anymore to just walk up to a complete stranger and have a casual and fun conversation. And so these are some of the tips and tricks that we, we teach because not only are you trying to connect that audience to this piece, but after the program's over, you want to continue and build that connection with your audience. So you need to be going out and talking with your audience. So how can you do that in a fun and effective way? Well, what do you say to an audience member after a concert? Like, I have no idea. I play all these concerts and they're like, Nice job on the Beethoven. I'm like, yep, thanks for coming. Pretty fun. Like, what do you, what do you, how do you engage with an audience post concert? How does Fifth Sh- Ensemble, or how do you personally? Yeah, it's a lot of times it depends on the concert and the concert experience. So, for instance, for our Journey Live concert, I knew the people that we, the majority of who we were bringing in would be fans of the game and fans of the concept. But, well, fortunately, again, because we only do things that we love. I was in love with the game. I could talk all day long about Journey Live. So I can just walk up to one of the fans and say, what did you think of the concert? And they might be a little hesitant at first or they might dive right into some of the concepts. And I can say, well, hey, what did you think of that sand slide scene where the music just kind of goes off? And then at that point, when when I've delved into something specific and I know that's something personal to them, then the conversations started. Um, one of the big secrets that I always share is if, if you want to make a friend, share a secret. And it, in this case, it's just share something personal, something that means something to you because it's going to show through your face. It's going to show through your emotions. And when I say, how did you like that sand slide scene? They're going to go, that's my favorite part of the entire game. And once that started, the conversation's going. You got him. Uh, so the same it. thing can apply with Beethoven. We've, we've done uh, a project recently with the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. And, and when we're, we're talking with students or fans about this, they may not have a personal connection with Beethoven, but you can talk about one of the other elements that's gone on. Maybe it was a projection, or maybe it was one of the stories that was told, or maybe they were a part of it. And you can just inquire. Um, the, the best thing that you can always do is just ask a good question. Because the second you ask a question, there's this need to have to respond. And once they respond, you can base the rest of that conversation off of their response. Well, and what you, what you were doing in, in Indiana through DePaul and what, what you've been working with the Cleveland Orchestra with, and they, I, I think it's a really special kind of engagement. People, bring people's stories into the concert hall. Can you just, like, talk through that? Because I think it's so amazing, like, like what, what, you, what you, like, maybe, like, DePaul or wherever you want to, whatever, uh, scenario you want to talk to, but just, like, what Fifth House has done to, to, like, take the the stories of the community and and highlight it in a concert sure yeah the uh the 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 best example i can give is the the work that we did at depaul university um where where they they were trying to trying to build community engagement and uh you know initially asking this question of how can we bring people into our concert space and it was only through talking with the community and, and you know, going in and engaging the students, the teachers, small business owners, and the farmers, um, and asking them these questions, that we found out what the, what the real narrative would be, what the real question was that we should be asking. Um, and through asking these questions, we, we found out that a lot of them were experiencing the same problems or the opposite side of the same problem and just didn't know it yet. So, for instance, you know, we had one of the farmers that we were talking to that had this great concert space, and uh, he would bring some of his local friends around uh, to perform, and they had tons of people show up for this. And he was asking the question, I would, you know, someday I'd love to bring in the students of DePauw and play here, I just don't know how to do it. 
and we would walk across town to the students at DePauw, and they'd say, you know, we've got this great chamber group, but just no place to perform. So simply by putting them in communication with each other, now they have this, I believe it's a monthly performance that they have at this farm space, and they have a built-in audience. And now these students that have been working hard in this material, they've got a place to perform. And so what we found out is by doing this engagement and by talking with the people, you become asset managers. You, you start to figure out who are the assets in the community, what are the issues, and how is it that we can line these up so that they become assets to each other, and most importantly, how the work that we're doing there can last far beyond the time that we're there. So the question that a lot of schools, performance spaces ask, which is how do I get more of these people out there into my space? The answer to that is a little more nuanced than that, and it's like, like what you all have been doing, going in and really like understanding who those people out there are and right. telling their stories and incorporating those into, yeah. in, into what you're doing. Well, this was another case of you have to fall on your face in order to figure out what works. Um, you know, years ago, we had this fantastic program with uh, Ezra Clayton Daniels, the graphic novelist that I mentioned. And uh, again, a fantastic program. And when we ran it in uh, Chicago... Uh, we knew we were bringing in Fifth House fans, we were bringing in Ezra's fans, and we had sold out performances, and it was fantastic. Uh, then we thought to ourselves, well, let's just take this show all around Chicago. So we decided to take it uh, through the park districts, and we went to the south side of Chicago. And, uh, you know, for all it, it, it basically bombed. We had v very little audience that showed up. Um, and that's a direct result of not knowing our audience. And the reason being is that you cannot just take any program from one area, transplant it, put it in another program, and expect the same result without knowing who it is that you're bringing it to. And in, the, in this particular case, when we brought it to the south side of Chicago, we weren't taking into consideration that uh, most people don't like to leave their houses after 5.30 or after school. They go from school to home and they stay there. And unless there is an extremely compelling reason, they're not gonna come out to your concert because yeah. there's things like just general safety that you right, have to consider. Right. Uh, so again, knowing who your audience is, is is key. And even more what we found is once you know your audience and engage them in the product that you're creating, they have ownership over that product. So they're gonna wanna help not only spread the word about the concert, but they're gonna wanna be a part of it. I've taught a lot of 15, 17, 18 year old, 20 year old students in my life. And even beyond 18, I've got the question like, should I do music? What, 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 like what? And you talk to a lot of young people, like what, if you just look at the state of affairs here at the end of 2017, it, you have this the, uh, less, less, traditional, I guess maybe we want to call it, although I don't know if that's a good term, but uh, career that you're doing with Fifth, Fifth House Ensemble, like what what would you s say to people? What advice would you offer to young people or their parents who are thinking about pursuing music as a vocation? If, if it's something you love, then you should do it. And yeah. I, I say that about anything, yeah. but especially the arts, because uh -huh. it's needed. It is absolutely needed. Um, it's unfortunately been you know a lot of it's been taken out of our schools um, which changes the dynamic um, yeah. because w what what the arts teaches you uh, just inherently is to think outside the box uh, it, it teaches you critical thinking it teaches you especially in chamber music how to work intimately with other people and in order to create a better product and these are concepts that extend far beyond just playing bass or playing flute or whatever it is um, that extend into your schoolwork and into your daily life. Uh, so I, I think it's absolutely essential that we bring in the arts. Um, and if you love it, find, find everything that you're passionate about and see if, if there's a way that you can co-mingle all those efforts. Mm -hmm. Because you can be the greatest bass player on the planet, but if... Um, if you've got other loves or other interests like that and you're excluding them from your final product, then you're not challenging yourself anymore. Right. And, it, and, it's, and it's constantly like, what scares me? You know, what, 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 uh, what, what am I afraid of? Am I afraid of getting up and, you know, improvising for the first time? Am I afraid of trying this? Uh, and if you're not pushing yourself as an artist, then you're not growing. 
and that's and that's what I would say. Like, music is essential, and it helps you grow as an individual. Um, and and the one big story that I love to share about this, and like how important music is to the community, is we we've done work with uh, St. Leonard's Ministries, which is a halfway house here in Chicago, and we were conducting a story circle where we were talking with the gentleman there, and. Um, through the story circle we encountered this one gentleman who wanted to pass every time on talking and finally you know through open conversation and using music as this catalyst for conversation just a simple question like you know what's your favorite band or what's your favorite artist and you know somebody would say oh I love Santana oh well I love Santana too well I hate opera oh I hate opera too at least you got the conversation going well that one gentleman finally spoke up and he he mentioned that uh uh, you know, what got him into music and especially jazz was on the opposite side of the prison, there was this Latino inmate who had this uh, tape and it was Smoke Gets In Your Eyes. And he said that he played that tape until it wore out. But that tape inspired him to pick up the trumpet. So he, at the time, the prison had um, this, you know, small music program and he was able to get up a tr get a trumpet. And prior to that, his stay kept getting extended because he kept getting into fights over and over again. He was just frustrated. He was angry, constantly fighting. He got that tape. He picked up that trumpet. And every day he was practicing. And because he was practicing every day, he wasn't fighting. He wasn't getting angry. He had a focus. He had a means of release, uh, you know, creativity and accomplishment. And so much so, and he practiced so hard that uh, there were prison bands that were asking him if he would like to join. And one of those uh, asked him to join, and he performed for the very first time, and he described the experience as completely terrifying. But when he was done, he never felt so excited and alive. Three weeks later, they removed the music program from that prison, and they took away his trumpet. And guess what happened? He started getting back into fights. His stay kept getting extended. He kept getting angry again. So what was essentially a $10, $20, $50 trumpet was something that was saving this guy's life. So the power of music, the power of art to change lives is substantial, and we can't, we can't just look away from that because we, we have found over our 12 years how powerful it is. So you've been seeing those examples in these 12 years and you're going into these institutions like that and like what, a, what, a, what an amazing experience and I don't know if you ever imagined doing this when you go back to 18 year old Eric, maybe, maybe not, but like if you could go back in time and talk to that Omaha, Nebraska, you know, student uh, about to embark for Eastman, do you have any advice you might give young, young Eric from oh your this vantage point? I'd be kicking my own butt, that's for sure. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. It's, uh, th there's um, a certain level of ego that you have when you're younger and you're, you're looking all too often introspectively as to uh, how I can make myself greater, how I can be you know, a better artist, you know, I need to achieve this, I need to do this solo recital to make myself better. And you're constantly looking at the self. And if, if I could say anything to him and convince him of anything, it would be to start looking out. Um, arts is a service, and we should always be looking at arts as a service. Um, and, and that means diversifying your interests as well. So I, I would definitely say, hey, by the time you hit college, uh, you know, don't look down on the fact that, you know, I was going to Eastman at the time and I was studying classical bass, but boy, I wish I would have done more jazz studies. Mm -hmm. We had one of the greatest, you know, sound and audio engineering studios in the country at the time, and they still do. Boy, I wish I would have taken some of those courses because that would have helped me substantially now. Uh, you know, take advantage of those things, but also get out and take what you have learned out into the community and just be talking with people. Um, because because the earlier you start engaging, honestly, the earlier you start realizing why it is that you're doing what you're doing. I mean, every time I see a light bulb go off over a student's head because they, they get a concept that they've been struggling with because you've, you've, you've commingled it with this music curriculum and it's like, oh, now I get it. Or every time you get a story like the one I just told you about that gentleman at St. Leonard's Ministries, uh, you, you take a step back and you realize that's why I've been doing this. It's not for my own personal gain. It's because I'm, 
I'm helping somebody. I'm helping tell their story, which has never been told. And it's one of the biggest things that I've learned over the years is that, you know, even though we're struggling in many ways because of the social media or because of how we communicate, we're struggling with communicating, but everybody always wants to be heard. And so if there's a way that we can tell their story through the arts, I want to find it. And that's what I would, I would definitely tell myself to do. Well, I love what you're doing. The past 12 years, I can't wait to see what you can do to do. Eric, great chatting with you. Fifth House Ensemble. And, and uh, check them out. They, they travel all over the place, probably near you at some point in the future. And just thanks for chatting. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it. Eric, you rock. Great chatting with you. And Fifth Dash House is their website. Check them out there. And a fun addendum to this conversation. So again, Eric and I are chatting. Here it is mid-December 2017 when we were having this conversation. I was in Chicago to do some work for Eastman Strings. I'm their product manager for basses. And I was also playing a bunch of gigs. I had arrived. I think that I'd been in town a couple days, but I had rented a car because I needed to go play gigs with a bass. So cars... <laughs> helpful for that. And I was doing the math in my head, like, eh, do I want to take this insurance? Do I not want to? I have auto insurance. And you know, the sort of endless debate that you have when you rent a car. And I just decided no insurance. Come on. Like, what are the odds I'm going to get hit? Okay, you can see where the story is going. <laughs> so I uh, picked up the car, dropped it off on a side street in Evanston that I had parked for a decade, at least I left my car there for weeks right? Went down, chatted with Eric. We had some food. We broke up the mics. We chatted. It's always so funny to look at the reactions of people when you're in a restaurant or a bar and you pull out microphones. Everyone kind of looks at you quizzically and kind of backs away five feet. So that totally happened there. And we get done talking. And then all of a sudden, my cell phone rings and it says Evanston Police Department. I think police department. What? So I pick up my phone and they say, Jason Heath. I say, yes. I say, you're car was just hit. I said, what? God, what are the odds? Uh, come on. Really? Really now? What are the odds? And, and it just sounded so dire. It has been in an accident. So what happened was there was a teenage driver that was getting pulled over by the Evanston police. And to make his bad day worse, as he was pulling over, he sideswiped my rental car. Now, it was not nearly as dire as the officer made it sound. Um, but of course, he's just like, perfect. The one time that I don't take insurance on a car, you know, in the town I lived for forever, on the street I parked for forever, might as well be my car, right? Then within two hours of parking there, I get hit. Lovely. Anyway, it all worked out, except probably not for that poor young guy. I'm sure he'll remember that day, not super fondly. But <laughs> so, Eric, again, great to chat with you and funny addendum. And it's all about the live moments. I, I love chatting with people live. I'm going to try to do more and more of that moving ahead with the podcast. Obviously, if I'm trying to connect with someone in France and I'm not in France, Skype or FaceTime or whatever, this is all good. But there's just nothing like doing these interviews live. So thank you, Eric. And thank you for listening. Share this with friends. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram or Twitter or do none of those things. If you're not into those things, that's cool too. But you can sign up for our email list and I send out info about the podcast and other base related things on a weekly basis. We've got thousands of people on the list and I would love to have you join there and in that conversation. And if you you do Facebook in any capacity, join our Contrabass Conversations Facebook community group. You can go to ContrabassConversations.com slash community or just look for us on Facebook and lots of good conversations happening there. Lots of good ideas for the podcast come from there. And the best way that I get ideas for the podcast is from you listening to this. So if you have a guest idea, if you have a topic idea, share that with me. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Com. Thank you for listening. We will be we will be back again soon, he says, tripping over his tongue, with more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs>